Okay, so I want to talk a little bit today about immutability, interactivity, and JavaScript. Um, so uh, I've been doing uh, JavaScript now for about eight years, doing user interface work. And um, a, a, lot of, a lot of what I've been thinking about recently is how um, with UIs, you often have what appears to be inherent complexity. And by sort of thinking and embracing immutability, I think you'll be surprised by how a lot of uh, what appears to be inherent complexity ends up being um, incidental complexity. And you can eliminate it. And ho I hope to demonstrate a bit of that today. Uh, so I, for four years, I was at the New York Times. And I recently switched over to Cognitect. Cognitect's pretty cool. They actually really embrace immutability on all their platforms and their products. They do lots of cool stuff. You should check it out. In order to talk about interactivity, we sort of have to start from the beginning. Um, this is some kids playing around on a Xerox Alto at Xerox Park. Um, I believe they're messing around with a Smalltalk system. Uh, so you can actually download a pretty good version of Smalltalk today. It's called Squeak. It's open source. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a pretty amazing um, programming environment. If you open up a system browser and start inspecting the internals of the system, uh, you'll find like the classes that are available and so on. Uh, you'll probably encounter model view controller, right? So I don't need to explain this too much. It's a JavaScript conference. Uh, MVCs are, are quite big in the JavaScript world. Um, but the, I, the concept was first formulated by Trigva Rienskog and Adele Goldberg and others at Xerox Park in 1979. Uh, very long shadow, right? Uh, the, the basic concepts are still prevalent today. Uh, to a large degree, I think this is because at an abstract level, uh, MVC is actually a sound separation of concerns, right? You have users, they want, they're interested in a certain domain, so you model that domain, um, and they want to interact with that via controls or, or some interesting interaction, and then you have to sort of manage uh, the domain model and whatever the users actually sees. Uh, so the, the thing I'm going to try to question today is um, uh, implementations. Uh, so for a very, very long time, um, MVCs have been, have been traditionally done over stateful objects. So I think it's possible to um, preserve all the things we like about MVCs, but we can do them without stateful objects. And that sound, might sound kind of crazy. It is kind of crazy. Uh, and hopefully, I can demonstrate that it's actually uh, practical to do this. Uh, but to sort of throw a wrench in the history of UI programming, uh, we have to talk a bit about the web. So this is uh, Tim Berners-Lee um, built the very first um, web browser using a rich MVC framework called Next Step, uh, which eventually became Coco. And when he designed the web browser, he wasn't thinking of uh, creating a whole new UI paradigm, right? The big idea here was just linking documents together and sharing them over a network. Um, it's a document model. It was never meant to replace uh, the rich UI frameworks that people were building for desktops. So um, by a very strange turn of events, uh, most, or not most, but certainly a large uh, number of people interact with computers via web browsers. And so what that's, what, that, what that's meant is that as JavaScript developers, we're forced to abstract over something that was never designed to, be, to, to sort of host uh, UI work. Uh, many of the challenges, many of the frameworks, many of these sort of standards that are happening are all trying to monkey patch the browser to be a suitable UI programming environment. Um, so you know, you do UI programming enough, and you know this pain, right? Uh, um, tools like Backbone, tools like Ember, Angular, um, jQuery, they're all trying to put the DOM, um, push it further down so that you can reason about something uh, higher level. Uh, still, I would quite like having done it for a long time, um, I've, gotten to, I've gotten to the point where I feel like doing UI programming on the web it kind of feels like this analogy that Alan Kay likes to make about software. Um, he, he sort of alludes that a lot of software architecture looks like this, like the Great Pyramids. It's really impressive, but there's no concept here. The only idea is that it's going to take thousands of, year, or thousands of people and hundreds of years. right? There's not, like a, there's, not a, there's not like a real principle at play. And he points out how architecture changed very radically as soon as it sort of uh, chanced upon a very good central concept. And uh, he points out the arch, right? The arch sort of radically changed um, human notions of architecture. And, and he points out that software really needs to do this. There's often 
uh, when, we, when we design something, if we can find an arch, uh, we can often um, you know, get a lot, a, a lot more value out of our systems. We can build simpler systems. Um, so objects did give us something great. I think MVC is really cool. And uh, again, we don't want to like, eliminate the good parts of it. Um, but I feel like we're still missing something. And then you could ask, well, if, if the object-oriented guys don't have the answer, what about the functional programming guys? So if you follow functional programming, which is getting more and more popular these days, um, you might have heard something called FRP. That's functional reactive programming. It came out of Haskell. It's uh, pure FRP is still very much an active area of research because people are trying to figure out how to make it efficient. Uh, you might have heard of Rx. Rx is really cool. It's a reactive extensions. It's a, it's a Microsoft take on FRP. Um, fundamentally, though, it's a coordination language. It doesn't really do much for the fact at the edge of your coordination, you're going to have to mutate the DOM or show something to the user. Um, if you are familiar with Go or Clojure's core async, you might have heard about something called CSP. I, I actually blog about CSP quite a bit. Um, you can also accomplish similar things to CSP via ES6 generators. But again, while it does manage synch um, asynchronous events and it's great for streams, um, it's still a coordination language. It doesn't really do anything about the rendering problem. Uh, at, which, at which point you, we might say, well, maybe, maybe MVC is the best thing. Maybe stateful objects really capture uh, how we um, uh, conceptualize user interfaces. Maybe there isn't a more fundamental thing. And hopefully, by the end of the today, I can convince you that um, immutable objects are pretty awesome, specifically persistent data structures. And if you organize your, your application around persistent data structures, you get a lot of cool properties. Um, so the, the next few slides I'm going to show are not my own, uh, because the slides that somebody else did were perfect. Uh, there's a really great uh, initiative in New York called Hacker School. It's sort of like a writer's retreat for programmers. There's a facilitator there named Zach Allen, and he produced a series of slides for Strange Loop, which is a, a great uh, conference in the States um, on like, sort of non-mainstream programming languages and approaches. But he put together a great series of slides. I'm just going to use them to explain uh, how persistent data structures work. Uh, they're, they're very well known um, to Clojure programmers, of course, or Clojure script programmers, um, very well known to Haskell programmers and Scala. But outside that community, they're not very well known. So I, I think it's worth taking some time to explain um, the idea. So functional programmers, what they like to do is they like to, you know, functions and data. That's it, as much as possible. So functional programmers want immutable values. They don't want stateful objects. And the whole idea of changing something it's really, you, you, you don't, if, if I have a data structure and I change it, I'm not going to destroy the old one. So with, if you have a stateful object or if you have a mutable array, you're destroying the previous value that it represented and that represents some new value. Uh, it's possible to avoid this. Um, and that's where the word persistent comes from. Persistent data structures, they give you the convenience of regular data structures, but they don't destroy the previous value that was represented. Um, and I can show you how they can be fast. That's what's really cool, and that's what's relatively new. Um, I would say people did not understand this until within the last decade, how this could uh, actually be done uh, efficiently in practice. So persistent data structures might sound really advanced, really scary. They're, they're not. Um, I imagine almost everybody in this room has seen uh, a linked list. Um, if you understand linked lists, you can understand persistent data structures. So here's a list with x at the head, and it has some tail. This, um, hopefully familiar to all of you. If I want to, a different value, right, what's really cool about a linked list, I can just um, cons or like construct a new value by putting something at the head, and I can just point to the tail. So that means I have a value x and I have a value y, and they're sharing more than 50% of memory, right? They're, they're sharing the, their contents, even though they represent two different values. You could have another variable that points to the tail of x, and we now have three distinct values that share memory. This is structural sharing, um, and that's the big idea behind persistent data structures. So sharing structure gives you uh, efficiency in space, um, but it also gives you ef uh, efficiency in time, because you're not losing time copying things, right? What was really cool about those different values we, were ha we had is we didn't have to copy anything. Um, so you can actually take the linked list idea and, and, and generalize it. So Phil Bagwell, who unfortunately passed away, um, innovated uh, a, a very efficient encoding um, 
uh, called the Hash Array Map Try. It was actually a, a mutable collection. It wasn't until Rich Hickey, the inventor of Clojure, came along, saw that you could modify it just a little bit and get an extremely fast um, family of persistent data structures out of them. So he invented something called the bitmap bit mapped vector tree. And the way that it works is that it, it, it effectively it works like a JavaScript array. It's random access. You can push things at the end efficiently. Um, you can iterate it over it quickly. And basically, the way that it works is it's an, it's, um, each node is an array, and it's a tree of arrays. Right? It's arrays that point to arrays. And that might sound a bit weird, but we'll, we'll dig into that. And the way we do lookup, it's a prefix tree. So we take the index, and the index itself um, gives us the prefix into the tree to find the location of a particular value. So it, it's a bitwise tree. So a persistent, a persistent vector, this is what it looks like, uh, one possible implementation. You can imagine a JavaScript array with, that contains four elements. Each of those elements is actually a pointer to four more arrays. Each of those point to four more arrays that have, again, four slots. And then finally, you'll hit like the last level, and the last, the leaf nodes, right, contain the actual elements themselves. So what does finding something in a data structure that looks like this entail? So um, here we have the, we want to find the 106th element, right? So that, there's actually a binary, right? That's, we can represent as that as a binary. It, it is a bi you know, the, the binary version of that. And what we can do is we can say, we can mask off the first two bits. We can mask off the first two bits. And what we, when we do that, that gives us a number. That gives us the number one. So we know to look from the root at the, what's, what's at the first inde uh, at index one. And that takes us to the next level. We can mask that one. And that says, oh, that's um, the value two. So we can look at the second, the, in, the second index of the second level. That brings us one level down. Again, we mask off the next two bits. Again, that's two. The last set of uh, bits that we have gives us, um, you know, look at the second index. We're done. There's no, more, there's no more bits to mask off. And we have the element 106, right? So how many operations do we need? Uh, we needed four, three, four array lookups and just some bit operations. These are, these, these are the types of things that JavaScript engines um, are very aggressive optimizations on, on these types of things. So what does it mean to update a persistent vector if we want to update it? So all we have to do if you want to update this persistent vector is to update only the path that changed. That's all you have to do. All the other arrays that weren't on that path can be shared. Right, so exactly the same as the linked list. Most of the, most of the memory is going to get shared. And as it turns out, um, array cloning, if you do it correctly, uh, quite a few JavaScript en uh, engines optimize that as well. So the main thing we should be thinking is, what about the branching factor? Is 4 the optimal one? As it turns out, that's not the case. Uh, after a, a lot of empirical testing, uh, closure on the JVM picked 32, and pretty much uh, anybody that implements them picks a, a size similar to this because it, it, it maps very well to modern hardware and cache lines. And so 32 gives you very good lookup performance as well as update performance. So just to show you how crazy this branching factor is, imagine a persistent vector that had seven levels, right? That's 32 to the seventh power. That's 34 billion elements, right? That if, if, that was, if, that was a, if that was an array on a 64-bit operating system with a 64-bit JavaScript VM, that's 256 gigs of RAM, right? So in a persistent vector, you can get to any element in seven hops, and you couldn't even represent it in memory. So and updating a 10 billion item vector only requires you to change uh, and clone um, seven arrays. So, Hopefully, that gets you a little bit excited about how persistent vectors work. Um, this is exactly why I, I decided to do OM. Like, I was very familiar with persistent data structures. Um, and then React came out, and I was like, this is going to be a really awesome pairing, taking the persistent data structure approach and the diffing approach that um, React offers. Because what we can do now is we can represent our application state just as an immutable value. And we can apply a function. And then React will calculate the virtual DOM, right? React gives us a, another value, which is the virtual DOM representation. If something in the application changes, we have immutable data. 
So we're just going to get some new value, apply the function, React will compute the new virtual DOM. And the way that React works, um, it basically takes the two virtual DOMs that it produced and it cal calculates a minimal change set. So we don't have to touch the DOM directly. React sort of co remote controls the DOM, so to speak. What's interesting about this model is that we can flip v0 and v1. We can get the reverse change set for free. Right? Normally, you'd have to use some sort of command pattern where you have to calculate the reverse delta. So we don't have to do this. React will do that for us. So just a, a real quick demo. Um, so one of the very first things that I did when I, when I saw that um, pairing functional uh, persistent data structures with React, I was like, oh, I wonder how hard, hard undo would be able to implement, for example, to do MVC, which is a kind of reference uh, application for uh, JavaScript MVCs. So there are, there are actually about like five lines of code that are relevant here for undo. And just really quickly, I'm going to go, um, you know, the same, you know, to do MVC that you've seen a million times. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, you can't see it. Uh-oh. Thanks. One second. There we go. Okay. So I'm adding some uh, to do items here. I can Click this. At the top, you can see how fast it's rendering. It's far faster than 60 frames a second. Um, I can go like this. I can switch uh, which things I'm looking at. I can clear the completed. And then, right. So that was, it was just five lines of code, and that's, we just get it for free. It's just free because React does the diffing for us. So going forwards and backwards in time, it's it really equivalent as far as React is concerned. And the snapshots are cheap because the difference between one app state and the next is very small. And the uh, persistent data structures give us the e efficient encoding of app state. Uh, so you might not be convinced, because to do MVC, it's, it's, like, it's cool, but it's kind of like a trivial application. It's, it doesn't really map to the type of things that people actually build. Um, fortunately, I can show something that I did not make. This is a uh, pixel editor by this guy, Jack Shadler. Uh, he works at Ableton. Um, he, re he saw my undo post, and he was like, well, is, is David Nolan, like, is he for real? Can you actually build apps this way? And so he decided to do something um, where he built a pixel editor. It's 64 by 64 pixels. So what he's doing is he's encoding 4,096 pixels into a persistent vector. So that's 4,096 individual pieces of state. And um, he was able to um, implement undo, redo, and previewing of any state. Uh, so I'm going to show this real quick. So here it is. So what's happening here is I'm actually updating in a persistent vector, right? OK. If I go up here, there are some undo states. I can, and you should see the preview. If I'm scrolling over here, you can see that the preview updates very quickly. So how much code did this take to do? That's it. This is, this is all the code that it took to do undo, redo, and the preview. Again, because it's just how React works. It's just how persistent data structures work. So this is, this is like one of those you know, moments where like, oh, something that we thought was inherently complex was not inherently complex. It's incidentally complex because you want to build such a system with stateful objects. Stateful objects are what make uh, doing things like this complicated. Ooh, sorry. Um, the other cool thing is you're probably wondering how much memory this takes. So I went ahead and um, did a test. And I imagined, what if I had um, 1,000 frames of, of these 64 by 64 pixels? I randomly update every pixel. So I used the Chrome profile, and I did a heap snapshot. So on the left is a heap snapshot of 1,000 saved sort of frames. It takes 2 tenths of a megabyte. On the right 
I've allocated um, 100 um, arrays, and that's 1.7 megabytes, right? So the exact same thing, except persistent data structures, you're seeing um, you just save tons of memory by sharing structure in this way. So uh, the, the pixel case is actually the worst, right? You have 4,096 distinct states. Think about the types of applications you build. Putting your entire model into an immutable system is, is completely doable. Right? There, there are no real problems there. And it will likely be more memory efficient uh, than a traditional approach. Uh, so, you're, so hopefully you're excited about this. I didn't, you know, I, um, I, would, you know I, I didn't talk too much about ClojureScript because you can actually try this stuff out uh, with a library that I maintain called Mori, which exports most of uh, the ClojureScript standard library. It also exports um, all the data structures so you can use them. Uh, there's quite a few people I know actually who, for various reasons, can't use ClojureScript, and they actually use CoffeeScript, Mori, plus Backbone, and React, right? Um, so it's, it's definitely possible to play around with this stuff without using ClojureScript. I will say that ClojureScript does, it, it is cool, and it does make some of these things more idiomatic, um, as well as um, ClojureScript is able to optimize the, the, more of the code. Uh, Mori is actually not that small. Uh, a lot of people, most people use it with Node. Uh, it's not as popular on the front end because it's of quite a big payload if, you don't, if you're not able to apply the optimization techniques we do in ClojureScript. Uh, so that's all I had, and I think I'll take some questions now. If you have an existing app built on, say, Backbone or any other MV style framework, how would you, would you propose that just like a complete rewrite to like refactor this paradigm, or is that something you could introduce gradually? Um, <clears throat> that sounds like a lot of work to me. Um, I do think, though, that it's possible. There have been quite a few experiments, for example, that... Cool. <laughs> What Can I that? just interrupt and say, can the people who are doing lightning talks come to the front as well, just while David's talking? <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Um, it's possible to, for example, do a, um, a collection, right? Like to, to do a collection that exposes a backbone API, but under the hood it's immutable. Like that's, that's, that's completely doable. There's like the API is completely separate from how you store that state. Okay, cool. Thanks. Got some more questions? One over there, sorry. Yesterday, Joaquin gave an excellent workshop about ClojureScript. And he posed the question, which I will function like an intermediary, uh, whether um, uh, ClojureScript, and in this case, OM as well, is ready for production. Would you advise against or for using it for a core, rather demanding client? Uh, people are using it in production. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there, is there something more specific you're looking for? Will it cost you your head if it fails or not? Will it, I'm sorry, I missed Will that. Will it cost it your head if you fail or not? Can I blame ClojureScript? Can you blame ClojureScript? <laughs> uh, as much as you can blame JavaScript. Well, it's very <laughs> easy, though. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any big examples of places where ClojureScript is, is being used or owns being used? Uh, there, there, I mean, I actually keep a, a list, though it's hard to keep track now. And actually, some people just use it and they don't tell me. That's yeah. like kind of the problem. A lot of people use it and they don't tell you what they're doing. Um, but uh, what's, what's happened is that there are a few people that are, I think, wrapping up products with it. Um, I think what's happened is a lot of people are definitely using React. Like in the ClojureScript world, people have embraced React. Again, it's possible to use React directly, mm -hmm. and you just get all the benefits. Cool. Any more questions? If we are doing sort of what you are saying, so we are actually using Mori and React together and so on. And I had a question about the size of the Mori library. You said it. That's the problem. Uh, should we try to use uh, the Google Closure Linker, or is it possible with Mori, or is there another solution? I mean, you get the point. So you can run the Google Closure compiler and compile everything, and you will get all the optimizations. Uh, I will say I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of the type of code you have to write for Google Closure. Part of the reason we did ClojureScript is writing that type of, type of JavaScript is not very fun. Um, but you can do it. If you want to, you can definitely do it. And I think somebody's done that, actually. Um, but the, the, as far as the size of the library, it's pretty big. I mean, because, again, we can't optimize it for JavaScript users. It's like 33K gzip, so it's a bit big for clients. Uh, people have, people, the node, uh, node users like it quite a bit. 
Um, the Meteor devs, Meteor, um, as I believe they're using it now uh, to do their package management constraint solver. Um, and they were able to get like a 50% 50, 50 performance increase by using it. There's another question in there. So if you had to use this uh, closure script like uh, persistent collections with uh, libraries that take like JavaScript arrays or, or Are anything Are you setting else? up the lightning talk now? What? I'm sorry. Uh, so if you had to use it with uh, libra uh, JavaScript libraries that use JavaScript arrays, is, a, is, is there a way to do that and is it fast? Um, there's not a way to make it fast. So I experimented a bit with ES6 proxies. So you can um, put a proxy around it. Uh, the problem is that it's too new of a feature for any engine to optimize. Um, you could imagine you know, being like, look, we want to use these data structures, but we want the same API that we always had. You got to optimize this stuff. So I would say the only thing people can really do there is just push browsers to optimize uh, proxying. Any more questions for David? Awesome. Okay, thanks very much.